Let's go ahead and open to Ephesians chapter number 4, where we are going to begin today. Paul has been trying to explain how the Jews and the Gentiles who believe in Jesus are one in Jesus. And so now comes his wonderful passage on unity, unity in Christ. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, the detainee of the Lord. Uh, He's in his own private residence uh, in Rome right now, awaiting imperial review. He has chains that attach him to the the Roman soldier that is accountable for him uh, while he's awaiting his uh, place in line for imperial review. But he says, I'm really a prisoner of Jesus. And that's true. I mean, he is on trial. He is under imperial review because he has faith in the Jewish faith about the Messiah. And the very Christian element of that Jewish faith, the belief in the resurrection of that Messiah from the dead after he gave himself up as the atoning sacrifice for sin and the future bodily resurrection of all those who put such faith in the name of he who is salvation. So he says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Walking stands here, Uh, as a symbol for life, moment by moment, day by day. We need to be living in such a way that it brings glory and honor to the call that we received into Jesus. Remember back at the beginning of this letter, Paul talked about we have been, uh, we've been, predestined, that is, had the boundaries set ahead of time, in Jesus. And so we've been called to come into Jesus. And so we need to walk in such a way, live in such a way, that brings honor to that reality. And here's an example of what you ought to be doing for that, what I ought to be doing for that. With all humility and gentleness. So not thinking mostly about ourselves, but thinking about other people. Not pounding down on other people, treading all over their heads, uh, but having gentleness toward those other people. And with patience, he says, with patience. You know, have a long, uh, a long fuse uh, before you ever think about getting mad. And showing tolerance for one another in love. So there's the love, again, that holds everything together. It is the governing principle. It is the first of the nine fruits of the Spirit. And we need to be tolerant to those that are different than us. This is not any variation from what Paul wrote when he was writing to the Corinthians and telling them they needed to think about each other, more about themselves, and and be part of the whole, working together. He said the same thing when he wrote the book of Romans. He talked about it in the book of Philippians. We need to have the same attitude that is in Jesus, who didn't just look at things from his point of view. He looked at things from the point of view of love for others. So we need to have all that as the backdrop to verse number three. Being diligent, uh, focused upon, to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we want to keep the church together, whole, peaceful, all because of Jesus. And then he makes these comments that break down into evidence for the triunity of God. There is one body. Now, that's the one body of Christ, meaning the church. There is one body. It is made up of both Jews and Gentiles. That's true. Paul had just written about that in the previous section. 
There is one body, and then there's one Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit of God who comes and indwells all of us. When he was writing in Romans chapter number 8, he says, if you do not have the indwelling Holy Spirit, you don't belong to Christ. See, the Holy Spirit indwelling everybody that's part of the one body is a mandatory idea, identifying relationship. So there's one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. Now, everywhere we've seen hope mentioned, it is ultimately a reference to the resurrection into the eternal body that will spend that eternity with God because of Jesus Christ. It's the hope of the resurrection, not just simply of Jesus, but of all of us who have put our faith in Jesus' death and resurrection. So the Holy Spirit is the one holding us all together in the church. And then he says in verse number five, one Lord, which is a clear reference to Jesus. One faith, that is one trust in Jesus as the Savior. And one immersion. We know that when uh, Jesus gave his instructions to the apostles uh, regarding the commission of how they were supposed to go out and preach and teach, it included the idea of immersing people into the one name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And of course, that name is easily represented by Yehoshua, he who is salvation, Jesus. And this one immersion is the ceremony that identifies us with his death and his resurrection. Remember the Colossians 2 passage, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live by the one who loved me and gave himself up for me. So immersion is a physical act that connects us in that rebirth. In fact, it's referred to in John chapter 3 as the new birth. And so we've got all of this that's attached to Jesus. And then, verse 6, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And so God the Father is the overarching figure that keeps it all together. And so we have the triunity of God mentioned here. God the Father who is in control of everything, orchestrates everything. Jesus the Son, who lays his life down and takes it back up again, and we embrace him by faith, and we're immersed into his death and his resurrection. And then we have the Holy Spirit, who is promised to all those who embrace Jesus as their Savior, to be an indwelling influence, who will then lead us, who will then fill us with his fruit. And all of this is because of a connection with the one true God. Verse number seven. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, we've talked about grace being unmerited favor. But there is also this this, um, understanding that it is a gift that God has given through the power of the Holy Spirit to help us grow up and be mature and also be part of the one body. And so we've been graced by God with this unity that Paul is emphasizing here. And it comes through the work of the Holy Spirit according to the dictates of the Holy Spirit. But it comes by the power of Jesus' death and resurrection and at the direction of the Father. Verse number 8, Paul quotes from an Old Testament passage. It's actually Psalm 68, verse number 18. Therefore it says... When he ascended on high, 
He led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, that last phrase is Paul's rewording for purposes of what's coming next. The actual quote from Psalm 68 is just the first two lines there. Uh, And this comes uh, from uh, a passage that is trying to focus on this idea that God is in control. And so Paul grabs hold of that concept and says, yes, God is in control through what he did through Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So here comes his application of this psalm passage. Verse number 9. Now, this expression, he ascended. So he ascended on high. What does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? Now, there's a double meaning here. Because in Philippians chapter number 2, which I kind of alluded to a little while ago, Paul had said that Christ did not consider equality with God the Father something he needed to cling to, to snatch at, to grab hold of, because he had it. But instead, he emptied himself and took on the form of a human being. And being found in that form, he was obedient. He was obedient even to the point of death, death upon a cross. And it was because of that that God then highly exalts him. And so in the descent from on high, we have Jesus coming to earth from heaven. And then Jesus goes farther down by dying upon earth and going down into the innermost parts of the earth, that is into Sheol, as the Hebrew would say, or into Hades, as the Greek would say, the place of the dead. So Jesus just kept going down and down until he'd accomplished the atonement. And then he was resurrected back to planet Earth, and then he was ascended on high back to the right hand of the Father on high. And so Paul is making that application here from the Psalm 68 passage, the very first line, when he ascended on high. Uh, But it wasn't just that. When he goes on high, it says that he led captive a host of captives. So he is a victor, and to the victor goes the spoils. And it's not just simply the prisoners of war that conquering heroes take away. They also take the freed people with them in celebration. And I really do believe that this passage here in Ephesians uh, should be applied to the fact on the day that Jesus resurrected, on that morning, that is when all the saints of old who had been waiting in Hades, in Sheol, for the atonement to take place, they went back to glory with Jesus. Jesus took them into the heavenly realms and introduced them into the eternal presence of his Father. Uh, As uh, the book of John tells us, um, the Holy Spirit could not come and indwell people again on planet earth until after Jesus had been glorified. That's John uh, chapter number uh, 7. I think it's right around 30, 38 and 39 uh, in the verses there. I think that can also apply to the fact until the atonement had taken place, no one could come into the presence of God the Father, among the righteous dead even because their atonement had not yet been fully completed. And so, previous to the cross, previous to the resurrection, the righteous dead were with the righteous dead in a special place, sometimes referred to as the bosom of Abraham or paradise. 
after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as Paul bears testimony, the righteous dead are absent from the body and present in the Lord's presence. And so that all changed, I think, on resurrection morning. He led this train of redeemed persons out of Hades and right into the presence of God Almighty. But the last line in Psalm 68 says that you received gifts among men. So in this portrayal in the book of of Psalms, it's the conqueror gets given a whole bunch of gifts. But Paul says, you know what? Not only did Jesus receive all authority in heaven on earth, and was worthy of all praise and honor and glory and blessing and power like we see uh, given to him, attributed to him in uh, the uh, chapters 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation. He also turned around and gave gifts back to the people that remained on planet Earth. That is, the people who were part of the body of Christ, the church. And so Paul now wants to focus on that fact, that Jesus did not leave us without assistance. And so it says in verse number 11 of Ephesians 4, And he gave some to be, or he gave some as apostles. And so the first gifts that he gives to the church would be the leadership slots, the leadership persons, the apostles that he had worked with, the 12 apostles of the Lamb. He leaves them to take the gospel to all the Jewish people on planet Earth in that first generation, and they got it done. Uh, But he also had his special apostles like James, who looked after the church at Jerusalem. And more specifically, we're thinking about Paul, who is the apostle to the Gentiles, who is in the process, as he's actually writing this, he is in the process of trying to get the gospel even to the top of Roman society, to the emperor himself. So Jesus gave all of us, the apostles, as a gift to the church, and uh, they are the ones that generate the apostles' teaching, uh, which we find here in our New Testament. Uh, But it wasn't just the apostles, it says, and some as prophets. So prophets were those, especially in that first generation, that were supercharged with information as to how the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled in New Testament events. And so between the apostles and the prophets, we get our New Testament. So they are the foundational leaders of the church. Uh, We got them in our first generation of the church. Uh, They were not, uh, these are not positions that just kept being filled. They were really important there at the very beginning. And you may even remember back in, in, uh, I think it's, uh, I can't remember now. We're going to have to just go with my uh, in, in my generic in, uh, encouragement. Go back and you'll see that the apostles and the prophets were the foundational members of the church. Now, it goes on, though, to say that he gave other church leaders. He says, and some as evangelists. Uh, evangelists are those that go out and preach the good news. They are groundbreakers. They are the missionaries. They are the point of the spear, uh, if the spear is the preaching of the gospel. Uh, But also, some of these evangelists are troubleshooters. They are the ones that go in and fix, tweak uh, problems in some of these churches uh, that get a little bit off track. So, We need these evangelists, even today, going around and being the frontiersmen, the the ones that break new ground 
for the gospel. Uh, They are the Bible translators. They're the ones that are on the ground first in a new region that has never heard the gospel before. So we really need them. And they also need to go in and fix the soft spots, the places where, for whatever reason, uh, the church loses ground. It loses traction. It falls backward. We need these evangelists to come in and pump back in the energy of the Holy Spirit into uh, the dying embers of a local congregation. And then it says, and some as pastors and teachers. uh, And in, I think, most of the texts of the Greek uh, Bible here, uh, those two go together, pastor-teachers. And I'm going to just tell you, this is where I see myself. A uh, pastor is all about shepherding people, helping them stay healthy, helping them grow and mature, and helping them stay on track. And the teachers, well, a teacher is a person who passes on information. They absorb it and then manipulate it in such a way that it can be assimilated uh, by different peoples in different ways, and they pass it on. The pastor and teachers are the local, long-term leaders in the church. And we definitely need a healthy crop of those. And so you need to really appreciate your pastor teachers uh, in your congregation. And here's the reason why all of these gifted leaders were given to the church. Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. Now, you remember uh, earlier in the book of Ephesians that we were saved by grace through faith, and this not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. We are the workmanship of God prepared or, or, and now we're being prepared to do good works, which were prepared ahead of time for us to do. And so here he is following up on that idea from earlier in the book. The leadership in the church, which Jesus gifted, is there to help the saints get ready to do that stuff. And it's also there, they are also there for the building up of the body of Christ. You know, um, If you want to think about it, the apostles and the prophets gave us the training manuals. That's the New Testament. And then those of us who are evangelists or pastors and teachers, we are the ones who make sure that we follow those training manuals, that we go through the exercise regimens and routines to make the church stronger. You know, if a body does nothing, it atrophies. It loses the ability to do things. So it has to be pushed sometimes by trainers in order to get that job done. So that's what the leadership of the church is all about. They are the trainers of the body of Christ. Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. That's where he started this section, right? That we're all supposed to be committed to the unity and of the knowledge of the Son of God, knowledge here in the sense of having a relationship, to a mature man. All of us need to be growing up, both physically and mentally, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. All of us want to attain to our highest ability, highest potential. You know, when you were a little kid, you kept stretching, you know, trying to get a little bit taller little bit older. You're always wanting to grow up. Well, in this sense, everybody in the church needs to grow up to their full potential so that we can work for Jesus. And verse 14, as a result of all of this, as a result, we are no longer to be children. Now, he mixes a whole bunch of metaphors here, and that's fine. Uh, Because in every instance, the point is, don't get tricked. Don't get 
sidetracked. Don't get harmed. So when you grow up, you don't act like a little bitty uh, child anymore, an immature child. You are not as naive as you were back when you were a kid. So when we've grown up because of the actions of the leaders within the church, we're not going to be like little kids. And we're not going to be tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. That's imagery from a a ship out at sea, which can get pushed here and there, and it's coming up on the top of one wave and crashing down into the trough between waves. And if we are trained well by the Word of God, at the hands of these leaders that are in the church, then we will be a good, solid ship going through the storm of life. And we're not going to be, by the way, caught up in this trickery of men by craftiness in deceitful scheming. See, we don't want to get conned. All of us know if we don't keep our head on straight, we will get conned. I mean, the spamming thing is out of control. You always have to check everything before you click on a link, right? Or before you answer an email or a phone message. Instead, this is what we should be doing in the church. Speaking the truth in love. That's God's love. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. So Christ is in charge, not any of us. Christ from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So Jesus is the head. We are the individual parts of the body of Christ. And we're supposed to be working together maturely and appropriately to make a difference in this world and bring other people into the body of Jesus Christ.